Well, good evening, all. Um, I am Sarah Lewis, the Director of Planning and Zoning. Um, according to my laptop, it's about 6.03. I'm sure there are going to be people continuing to join us this evening, at least I, I hope so. Um, this is a uh, uh, exciting um, project and we've got some, we've got some good things to, to show you based on um, where we were and where we've, where we've come from. Um, I'm gonna give you a brief overview um, and then when I hand it off, I will, will um, let Alan introduce um, his team. Um, I will say that we've got representatives this evening here from not only planning and zoning, um, but we've been coordinating with uh, the public space and urban forestry division very closely because of course this does include a civic space um, and economic development given that it's a, a city held um, property um, and also with uh, the mobility team um, with the work that's already been done but um, let me let me just jump in if you can go to the next slide Rodrigo please um, so I think the, this is generally what we're going to go through this evening, and, and um, I'm going to give you the, the, the brief process overview for, for any folks that might not have been here um, so far. I don't want to re repeat anything, but we can revisit at the, at the end if there are, if there are questions. Um, I do want to go over what we've heard so far. Um, and what has led us to this point in the, the design evolution um, of this project. And then I'm gonna hand it off to, uh, to Alan um, from NBBJ uh, to go through the different schemes. Um, and then we can talk about the, the future, the next steps um, going forward. So next. Um, so the process overview is, is as everybody I hopefully, hopefully knows that since the Gilman Square neighborhood plan was done, there have been a lot of changes um, on the ground to obviously more detail on what's going on at the high school and on um, the, the hill in general, um, what's been going on with the, the GLX station and the push and pull that has happened as, as that's coming to fruition. Um, and then the, you know, sort of the home in sight itself. Next. Um, so, you know, there's been a lot of work done in, in this area already. Most, most recently, the, the streetscape and intersection design, uh, the community has been working with mobility. And I believe that was the Howard Stein Hudson team to look at what happens with the alignment for Medford. Um, and with the intersection with Pearl Street. Um, the, this project is the zoning analysis and massing study. So we've completed the first phase, which was sort of the two dimensional um, pieces. Uh, next slide. Um, and that was, that was phase one of this project. And so that was um, looked at, we used summer voice, you know, sort of we had the neighborhood meeting. Um, there's uh, uh, information available on summer voice to, to go back and look at the previous presentations and things like that. But we are currently in, uh, next slide, in phase two, which is starting to get into the three dimensions. Um, and so, this accounts for a lot of the, um, uh, oh, we just, sorry, we just got an announcement that I'd like to acknowledge that, acknowledge that Councillor Matt McLaughlin has joined us. He had a few technical difficulties, but he's, he's here now too. So thanks for coming, Matt. Um, the, so we've, we've received a, a lot of feedback during the process. And one of the things that we have been struggling with is sort of knowing the, you know, the grade change up to, to Central Hill has been, has been a tough one. Um, and understanding what the, the zoning um, looks like in, in different variations on, on this, uh, in this area, both the mobile site and the Holman's building site. Next. 
Um, so what we've what we've heard over the the schemes that had been shown in two dimensional was, you know, the neighborhood would love a larger uh, centralized open space, a civic space, um, in some configuration along Medford and Pearl Streets. So the idea that that is a highly visible location and acts as a unifying element for different parts of the site. Um, and I'll, you know, sort of gives the community back. One of the things that we've always heard is the getting the square back in, in Gilman Square. Uh, we also heard that there's, you know, sort of potential and appetite for additional height, um, increased density on this site, uh, given the fact that it's, you know, sort of across the street from, from any lower buildings and and it does back up to the train tracks and um, up to the, the, the central hill. So there's a large grade change that can sort of handle some additional height. Um, and as, the, as we've talked about all along, it's, it's the making sure that we understand how there is an accessible pedestrian connection from this site to both the station and the community path, or at least to the community path so that the station is can be accessed. Um, that's something that is, we will talk about in, in all of the schemes, but at this point, it's nothing has been decided yet because it is a, it's a trickier um, piece to fulfill. Um, and knowing that we're, we've got the difficulty of the, the slope on School Street as it currently exists is cannot be made accessible just due to the grade of the street itself. So if we can go to the next one, please. Um, so as I'd mentioned, the, this is a revision um, of the, the schemes that we presented in two dimensions at phase one. So there are three main schemes that we would be looking at. And I think it was six that we had um, as part of the, the voting in phase one. So the getting to finding out what the similarities were, what the preferences were, for the different schemes has sort of led us to these, these three schemes. They have been tested for um, higher building types than um, starting at MR6, but one of the schemes we also looked at that has larger footprints that might be able to handle larger building types, um, taller building types. Um, so Alan will explain those. Now, in the time that we've met last, of course, there is one other challenge. We, this site has to accommodate a large underground stormwater management tank. Rodrigo, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so this, this is the footprint um, that, that we were given uh, for this tank. It's, a pro, it's about a quarter acre um, in its actual footprint, and it would be about 20 feet deep. Uh, this is something that engineering is working on at the moment. And so we're hoping that uh, that when we decide where we want to go from an urban design perspective, they, they will work with us to figure out where this um, uh, hundreds of thousands of gallon uh, tank um, is located. Ideally, it will be under the civic space, um, but that is, you know, sort of like I said, that is yet to be determined and that, that does give us some challenges for designs and plantings, um, but we can talk about that, you know, sort of further on, you know, so I'm getting ahead of ourselves right now. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, so at, at this point, I'm, uh, these are sort of the three schemes as I had suggested and um, the, with the, the different options for the scheme C. Uh, so I'll just hand this off to Alan um, to, to take it from here regarding the, the schemes themselves. 
Thank you, Sarah. Uh, my name is Alan Mountjoy. I'm a principal with MBBJ here in Boston, and Rodrigo Guerra is with me today, um, who may have to take over if my dog gets too noisy. Um, so, as Sarah said, we looked at uh, we've looked at essentially three site plans, or narrowed it down to three site plans. Uh, and tested them for MR6. The first two we tested for MR6, and the third we also tested for MR6. But we also, as Sarah mentioned, looked at slightly higher uh, heights and densities as allowed under commercial high rise, and then also a podium tower high rise option under commercial high rise. So you'll see those. Um, all of those, all of these have been tested for apartment, general, and commercial uses. We figured those are the most likely uh, types of uses that would be uh, uh, considered at this location. We did not include something like a biotech or something like that. So Rodrigo, if you can move to the next slide. So without further ado, um, I, see a, I see a note here uh, that somebody was locked out. Is there a way to let people in I'll continue. So, uh, so the first scheme uh, will look very familiar to many of you. It has a civic space located uh, on Medford Street. Uh, it has a mid-block passage uh, that extends Richdale into the civic space. It has uh, and divides the the two parcels that uh, divides the the mobile site into two blocks. Uh, it has a third building on the Homan site and a separate structure located within the civic space that could be used for a variety of either civic or commercial purposes. We are also modeling uh, for the purposes of this study, a parcel on what's called the triangle site, which is between Pearl Street and the Medford Street Bridge. Um, all of these, uh, if we go to the next slide, you can see that these were tested at the MR6 level. Uh, for those of you who um, need maybe a little primer on this, it allows for six story buildings, but the top two floors have to be set back uh, away from the street um, in order to reduce their visual mass. So that's what you see here. Um, it also helps a little bit on sunlight uh, and and light access into the civic space, although this civic space features a south facing and a north facing civic space, uh, which does give it good lighting. And we did a very basic uh, uh, light and sunlight study uh, to indicate uh, what that civic space would get in terms of direct hours of sunlight uh, during the summer hours and during the winter hours uh, we tested at the solstice. Uh, so you can see that the civic space gets uh, somewhere around 12 hours, portions of it get 12 hours of sunlight uh, during the summer. And of course, uh, considerably less in the winter time, uh, but, but still uh, receive some, some amount of sunlight. Uh, although I would say that it's closer to six or five or six hours of sunlight per day. Um, if you go to the next slide, uh, I think uh, as Sarah was mentioning, uh, this is a, a bit of a cross section through the site. You can see Medford Street on the left. The section is taken midway through the Homans site. If you're, uh, so you don't see the, the mobile site in this view. Uh, you can see the uh, civic space, the Gilman Square Station, which is a little bit lower. You can see the community, the, the community path, and then you can see the, the, the hill, central hill rising up uh, to the high school and the civic buildings up there and, and the, the power plant. So you can see the the, the scale change that occurs across the site. Um, and these buildings are approximately similar to those that have been uh, considered on the other side of Medford Street uh, under similar zoning uh, agreements, or at least under similar zoning ideas about six stories of buildings on the other side. Okay, so let's go to, so, uh, 
The second option may look very similar to many of you, but it, it has a couple of critical differences. Uh, one is this conforms, the site plan conforms to the current land ownership patterns. So you can see that the uh, mobile site in this case uh, is kept at its current configuration, which has kind of a triangular shape. And we felt that uh, that it did not make sense to turn this into two buildings, but to keep it as one building with a provision that would require a mid-block passage at the ground level to allow Richdale Avenue to come through. Thus, the civic space would in fact receive Richdale Avenue even under this scenario, similar to the last one, but would not be open to the sky. It would be a covered walkway that would get you there. And then the building that is on the Homan site would be uh, a little longer, um, extend a little longer along the tracks. And then the triangle site actually looks quite similar. And uh, the civic space actually is quite similar. And I might point out to you on some of these schemes, on all of these schemes, we have indicated where a possible pedestrian bridge could be located. Uh, certainly uh, connecting between a, the civic space and the community path would be a community priority. Uh, its exact location is not something that we wanted to establish at this point, but it would be, the idea would be that it would connect public space to the path and be accommodated within a building because it will probably need vertical uh, circulation, uh, an elevator or stairs or some kind of, uh, or I should say an elevator and stairs in order to provide for full access. So incorporating that into a building might make the most sense given the grade change that would be required. So if you go to the next slide, you can see that this again has been modeled with MR6, similar, um, uh, requirements uh, in terms of a six-story building that has a setback from the fourth story up in order to increase uh, light and to reduce the bulk of the buildings. And you can see that the civic space here is similar, but it is slightly different in terms of its orientation to Medford Street. Um, and then likewise, we did another study of this looking at the sunlight uh, opportunities on the next slide that shows uh, the sunlight that would be available within the civic space uh, in the 12 hour range in the summer and the five to six hour in the winter. Uh, so that gives you a general sense of, of, of the space. We were very cognizant of keeping these spaces open to the south so that they do get that sunlight. Um, and all of our schemes, previous schemes we ruled out were schemes that did not have good access to sunlight, um, which is why we're only uh, looking at three options at this point. So if you go to the next slide, you can see again, the sort of cross-sectional view. Again, this is a section taken mid-block, so you don't see this, the mobile site, you only see the home and site and the, uh, all the elements that I mentioned before, Medford Street, station and the community path. Uh, we did not illustrate in this case what the bridge would look like. Uh, I think you can imagine that it would be a fairly uh, long structure um, that would have to be engineered and would, would cost a fair bit, uh, hopefully be uh, taken up within the development budget of a prospective project. At least that's the general idea. So now let's move to a, a third option that we did consider. Um, that uh, locates the civic space in a very different location. It locates the civic space where Medford Street and Pearl Street bend. And to the degree possible, it would combine with the open space that is anticipated uh, when Medford Street Bridge is closed. The, the, I would say the biggest uncertainty with this particular scheme is that the, the TPSS, the Traction Power Substation, which is located where Rodrigo is, is indicating, does have some access requirements. And we are not guaranteed that uh, 
we will be able to use some of that access space as public space. So it's it would in fact create a civic space that is quite visible at the corner of Medford and Pearl, but unfortunately uh, does neck down a little bit you know, before it gets to the Medford Street Bridge, but it would have direct access to the station uh, through the building. And then the two buildings that would be, uh, the development buildings would be perhaps more clustered together around an alley. Uh, and there would still be a Richdale Avenue connection through. And potentially one could imagine that the ground floor of this, uh, of this parcel that's numbered two could have many public functions that would uh, allow the public to go through that space, whether it's a market hall or something like that, that would then animate the civic space that is located uh, closer to Pearl Street. So um, maybe go to the image of that, the 3D image. So here again, you can see uh, MR6 modeled with the civic space at the corner of Medford and Pearl and getting closer to the Medford Street Bridge. However, that becomes a civic space. Uh, we still have a Richdale Avenue connection and imagining a active use on the ground floor uh, of, of this that would animate the civic space. Uh, and with good, with good south uh, frontage on the, um, so maybe if you can go to the next slide, uh, you can see that this gets very good sunlight uh, and access uh, and, uh, and, and is at a interesting location in terms of the turning point and might suggest a different crossing pattern of people uh, coming. It's a little closer to where the Gilman Street, uh, the Gilman Square was envisioned earlier uh, and potentially provide a direct access to the station. So I think, again, here's a, here's a view, uh, again, a cross section. Uh, you can see the TPSS building, which is not inconsequential. It's a fairly tall building. Uh, its biggest detriment is the kind of loading facility that it has on one side of it uh, that we don't know uh, to what degree it could be used as public space, either on a short-term basis or at all. Uh, it's something that has to be, still has to be worked out. So that's our that's our MR6 study. What we wanted to do, and what everybody, what we were encouraged to do, was to look at what this might look like if we imagined higher densities. So we used this C example, and one could imagine it working with B as well. Uh, we looked at what it would look like with a high rise uh, base. So the high rise uh, allows you uh, to go significantly taller uh, and eliminates the need for the setbacks. So we get a significantly larger development potential here, which ultimately could help to pay for things like public benefits, the, the, the bridge, et cetera, but has a certain impact visually on the site. In this case, less of an impact because it does not necessarily shadow the civic space, um, given that south is down on this drawing, it only would shadow the civic space in the late afternoon. So if you go to the image, and by the way, the civic space in this is slightly smaller. Uh, you may have noticed this civic space is slightly smaller than the other civic spaces, but it's our uh, contention that combined with the Medford Street Bridge uh, open space, it becomes a larger usable set of open spaces that are interconnected. So you can see here, uh, we modeled uh, the, the mobile site at, uh, at, at six stories and the, um, the home and site at 10. Uh, and you can see what that does. It's about 126 feet high. It is taller than any of the other buildings in the area, but it's still uh, less than the height of buildings on the hill, as it, as it were. Um, and I think we did a shadow study on this one. Is that right? So it doesn't have a dramatic effect on the open space, given that the open space is to the side of the... Um, of the of the taller building. 
but it certainly uh, represents a building that feels somewhat larger than what has been approved nearby uh, or has been anticipated nearby. So if you go to the plan or to the image here, you can see that it, it represents an increase in height from what is on Medford Street, but it still falls close to the height of that, which is on the hill, um, stepping up to the hill and taking advantage of the fact that this is a transit, uh, transit hub and could provide a variety of either housing or commercial uh, uses in the area, as well as pay for public benefits. Um, so then uh, I think going to the next potential uh, type of development that is uh, still uh, in the high rise, but what is called a high rise with podium base, which allows for a building of the same size, but with a much thinner tower that can go taller, but is much more slender. And, it has, and therefore it has requirements to step back from the neighborhood, step back from, back from the alleys and such. It can still rise from Medford Street, but it has to step back from all other sides. Uh, it, we didn't change the site plan here. We're just looking at what the massing would look like if it were to be uh, uh, considered as a high rise. So you can see here the tower gets quite small. It would be very suitable for residential use, maybe less for office use or commercial use, but it would certainly be a significant amount of residential density right at Gilman Square Station, which has pros and cons um, to it. Uh, but certainly this represents the full maximum build out of the high rise uh, designation within, within the, um, the uh, high rise uh, zoning uh, designation. So again, I think if you look over the other view, you can see it has very little impact on the shadows of the park. However, it will have impact on the shadows on Medford Street, uh, without a doubt. Uh, although it is a, sl a more slender tower, so it would have less of an impact during the day as the sun moves around, it would, uh, because I think this is partially why the high rise podium uh, is, was considered is that it creates a much less of a, of a block. Um, and then I think you can see in the last slide that this uh, would exceed the height of buildings on the hill um, by a, a considerable amount, um, but again, would represent a significant amount of development uh, on a transit oriented uh, facility. So I think uh, I think Rodrigo is that that's the that's the that's the deck right? Yes, exactly. So happy to take. Uh, oh, sorry, Sarah. I think this is this is your slide, the last one. Um, yes. So we are definitely happy to um, take some answers, and there's there's a t question and answer. So let me. The, the thoughts about the next step currently are looking at um, the, the city developing an RFP um, to see if we can find a developer um, for the site. Uh, so it, that's, that's sort of the first way to go about it. Um, another way is that we can do um, an urban renewal plan or a... Um, other more um, public process uh, to to get a basically a master to developer on on board, um, but how that you know sort of that's there's lots of pros and cons to to both of those pieces. So there's there's also a lot of detail that needs to be done. You know sort of as I'd mentioned at the beginning, and Alan had talked about in in the presentation that. The ADA access um, to the station is uh, becoming more and more um, looking like there might be an elevator needed. How that works is, is tricky um, with the, and hopefully, as we've said, would be included with whatever development takes place. 
Um, there's also work that still needs to be done on the, the final engineering of uh, the Medford Street uh, realignment. Um, and so there's a lot of work that's still to be done there. There's one of the things that we want to talk about is, is more about the, the Richdale connect, connection. Obviously, doing a, a through block movement does mean the footprints are smaller. Um, that also gets to the question that Christine has asked regarding the types of density on the other two options. Um, with the smaller footprints, it is much harder to um, to look at the the the, the taller taller buildings. Um, we certainly can, um, but it's. It at some point becomes a feasibility study that is better done by developers since we don't necessarily know what the market can truly bear as far as the use goes. So the smaller footprints might actually you know, be more suited to remain residential and therefore may not be as tall because they can't support the, for example, a, a podium tower. As a, as a building type. Um, so the as we get into discussions, I, I think if there's um, there's reactions and, and, and keep in mind, you know, sort of we, um, this is meant to be provocative. So the high rise tower as shown um, is, you know, sort of quite tall, um, but whether there are what that, I'm going to call it a break point might be as far as the, the height for the community. It's some of the things that we would like to, to talk through. And, and then once we get to sort of more of a consensus and, and hear what your responses are, then we as the city will be able to understand better the, the best way to go through, whether it's a rezoning, whether it's an overlay, whether it's a map amendment. Um, uh, we are, you know, sort of that still needs to be determined. Um, uh, there's one more question that just came through from Matt uh, Carlino. Did you consider any options where some of the buildings were not all MR6, but a mix of four and six? Um, that is still possible. Um, but at this point, it's, I, I think we should, we should open for larger discussion because uh, we wanted to hear, we wanna hear from you. Um, if, for example, in the one scheme that has the two smaller footprints that flank Richdale, if those buildings are more suited to four stories, uh, we can certainly can certainly talk talk about that. Um, but I I think the I'll let um, I'll let Alan start start fielding some of the questions because I think if if we can put up. Um, Rodrigo, could you put up one of the, the schemes? Yeah, just in plan, so at least we have something to, to talk about. That would be helpful. Well, I think uh, actually the axonometric may be more uh, useful in terms of looking at that. So I think you can, uh, one might imagine that uh, in, in a scenario such as this, that that would be a four-story building without the setbacks to the six. Um, you can imagine that, uh, I think. Uh, I don't, I think this is what we, we want to be listening to is what, what are the preferences? I think in the laps, and one of the later options, uh, the C1, we did include a stepping down on the mobile site uh, so that the mobile site was at six stories and the home and site was taller, uh, but one could imagine stepping down. Uh, I think that, yeah, that one, uh, one could imagine that being stepping from six to four. Um, I think we're, you know, open to 
this, these are tests to see what, uh, what the level of comfort is in the community with height, uh, knowing that a certain amount of development is desirable at transit. Uh, but finding that right visual, uh, finding something that fits with the neighborhood is also equally important. Uh, the tunnel uh, question, uh, you know, I guess we see it as a relatively short tunnel um, that could be a way to connect. I, I think that if it's activated on the ground level, uh, I think some of the examples uh, that uh, some of them are enclosed, by the way, uh, ones that we like. Uh, the open ones, I think, uh, could still have benefit. Uh, I think it's a great place to park your bicycle, frankly. Um, but it's also, I think, can be valuable if it doesn't feel desolate. I think if it has ground level uses on it, it would be valuable. But I, I appreciate the point. I think active would, in this case, would mean retail uses of some sort along the base that have glazing, that have activity within so that uh, it doesn't feel like a um, you know, sort of a, 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 a desolate place that doesn't have anybody looking out on it. And there is plenty of room in these ground floors. The red color implies a certain amount of retail uh, on the ground levels. Uh, as well as potential building, building uh, entries and such. Um, got a question from Tim here about uh, space allocated for mass DOT is rather large. Uh, I'm I. Yeah, we can let we can let Charlotte answer answer. One, um, she's been coordinating with the mobility team most closely and probably has more info than even I do. So the, um, the information that I have is, it is theoretically maybe possible, but it is a very, um, it's, it may be possible, but it's unlikely and we should not count on that if the MB, or if MassDOT, the MBTA, decides to let us use air rights, that's fantastic and we have another option, but we don't want to um, assume that we will be able to use air rights in that area and base a project on that only for the MBTA to say, no, actually we can't do that. So we would, we would love to um, be able to use those air rights, but we're not counting on it. Uh. So I think uh, Sophia uh, expresses herself very well. Um, I presume uh, she means the, uh, the high rise version. So thank you for that comment. The high rise podium version. Yeah, so um, I think we're, we're seeing more of this uh, where, uh, where uh, access is provided within a building. Um, we're seeing some of this in Cambridge, uh, at Cambridge Crossing, where the indoor is an area that is allowed. Um, Ellen, hold on a second. Thank, thank you, Christine, for flagging this. So the, the, the question that um, we just got to notice that the um, all the questions are not necessarily being ah. asked by okay. all participants. Got so um, Linda has asked, following on to Vicki's question, do you have an example of a private building with a public pedestrian bridge access? I would wonder about the hours it would be available for public use. Yeah, so I think, I think it, the building can be designed such that the space for the elevator section is enclosed, but it doesn't give you access to that building itself. In other words, it's, it, it's included within the volume of the building, but it is separate from uh, the building access itself. Uh, so I think there are examples of these that essentially accommodate public access 24-7 through the building, but do not provide access to the building itself. 
Thank you. And we have Sanjeev is also uh, agreeing with the high rise option feeling overwhelming to the neighborhood. Um, the other thing that I would like to acknowledge is I sort of just did it casually, but I didn't mean to, would like to acknowledge that uh, Representative Christine Barber is with us this evening. And so not only thank you for um, al allowing <laughs> forcing us to respond better by reading the questions, but also appreciate appreciate you coming and participating. Thank you so much. I think Rachel actually commented that the, uh, it, the elevator incorporated into a building is the design going up now in the Kendall Square station. Uh, so it's becoming much more common to see these sorts of things um, uh, within private development. Uh, th does, does anybody want to answer Christine Carlino's question about uh, health risks associated with spending time next to the transformers in the option three civic space? Sorry, it helps if I unmute myself. <laughs> uh, I, I am not a, uh, a, a public health expert in any way, shape or form. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I will, that is something that we can follow up on as far as what equipment goes in there, um, whether that will, I mean, both from a, a health standpoint um, and also the uh, a sound perspective as to what the equipment might be. So that is something that we can, we can definitely follow up on um, with, with both the, the mobility team and the, um, the GLX folks um, to see if we can work with, get our engineering um, division to, to, to help us identify what that might, the pros and cons of that location may be. Um, representative, sorry, uh, Council Ewan Campen would like to see as much affordable and mixed income housing as possible on the Homan site. So my question is whether any of these options would make it infeasible to do a greater than 50% affordable housing development on, on the Homan site. Um, uh, Councilor Ewan Campen, I do not believe so. Um, it does depend on um, how tall um, the building goes as to it's more about economic feasibility than I think any, than anything else. But as far as the, the physical dimensions, I do not believe there's any um, holdups with it potentially being affordable housing. Um, Will asks, I like the high rise residential option if it adds a significant amount of affordable units through inclusionary zoning. Um, well, thank you for, well, thank you for, for, for that response. It's sort of, it's, it's an interesting, I think maybe there's, there's a little bit of study that we need to do with whatever happens with the RFP to understand um, how tall is too tall? And I think that's a, that's, that's a development pro forma feasibility issue. Um, and that might be some of the reactions that we're, we're getting to the, you know, that was, as I said, it was meant to be provocative uh, as far as the podium tower goes. So I think there's, there's a, a play there that we need to work between the um, a, a <laughs> development team and uh, and what we would what we want to see as a as a city and and the community. Um, I am going to put out the question the, with the image uh, setting aside the the question about the civic space location and what's going on with the TPSS. Um, We've heard comments about the, specifically about the podium tower, um, but the image that's on the screen right now, that's sort of a high rise base, 
without the, the step backs? What are the general reactions to that? I would, I would love to hear some uh, push and pull um, on what that looks like as well. Um, all right, I've already got one answer, I think. Uh, <laughs> Matt Carlino, I'm hoping you're answering the, the, the question that, that, that I just posed, um, that it's, it's, it's still too, it's, Matt says it's horrible. So I'm assuming that means it's, it's still too massive. Um, Sophia thinks it's at least one story too high. Um, so these are, these are all good inputs, which is, which is what we needed. Um, we do have a question from Green Cambridge. What kind of barrier do you imagine would be between the buildings and the tracks? Um, I'm going to, I'm going to give an answer and then Charlotte, I'm going to call on you because I believe there is, at the moment, there is an MBT access way that has to remain in, in the rear of the buildings. So depending on the scheme that we, we end up, you know, leaning towards the, there may be an alley back there in addition. So there, there could be, you know, sort of a, a fair amount of distance between the actual tracks and, and the rear of the building. Um, there is the grade change in, in those locations. So at the residential or commercial floors above the ground will likely be higher than the, uh, the station or maybe at, uh, at least at eye level with the community path in some instances, but that will have to be investigated a whole lot further. Whether there will be a, I don't, whether there will be a, you know, sort of a wall or a, um, or, or just fencing and, and a planting buffer. At this point, we're, we're, not, we're not entirely sure, um, but we hope we can negotiate that with the, uh, the MBTA. This is Charlotte speaking. I think that basically answers the question. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I have more to add. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, Charlotte, if there are questions coming in the chat, can you flag those? I have the, the Q and A's open. Yes, I will flag those if any come in. So far, okay, thank comments, you. And I will just remind everyone that if you, um, if you submit your questions through the chat, once we mark them as answered, everyone else can also see your comments that you can, um, Kind of make statements that way. Whereas if you message us through the chat rather than through the Q and A, we don't have that ability. Um, so the the question and answer box is definitely the preferred way for you to submit comments, questions, all of that stuff. All right, thank you. Um, Thomas Champion asks, what type of zoning changes would be required for these alternatives? And would the rezoning have to be accomplished before the development of a city-driven urban renewal plan or an RFP? Um, Charlotte, do you wanna take this one? Or is that for me to answer live? That's for you to answer live. Once we mark it, answer live. Okay. Um, your name guess. pops. Yeah, your name pops up associated with it. So I wanted to make sure I wasn't overstepping my bounds. No, you are good. The um, the 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 zoning changes. Um, what we would like to do is is try to be um, somewhat flexible on this. So by issuing an RFP, um, and uh, Rachel can, can help me out here from economic development a little bit if necessary, um, understanding what, what the community would like to see here gives us guidance to issuing the RFP. And that's where 
the feasibility study comes in, the performer, you know, sort of we as, um, you know, sort of as planning and zoning are, are not capable of, of doing development level financial testing. Um, so we hope that we can get a, a developer to, to sort of help us with that, you know, on this particular site. So there's, um, it can sort of, it can go a number of ways. We could rezone it and then realize that we've rezoned it to the wrong thing because a developer is not coming to, you know, sort of help us develop this because, you know, sort of perhaps it's, we've zoned it to MR4 and it, you know, sort of it has to be six or is the break point, for example, between six stories and eight stories to get the, um, to get the feasibility, the numbers to, to work out. I don't know at this point in time. And so that, that's why the, I'd like to make sure that we are, when we go to rezoning, that we are definitely zoning to something that, that will potentially work. So rezoning the site to something that may just remain a vacant site, I, I don't think is, is, is anybody's, um, I don't think that benefits the neighborhood um, as much as we, you know, sort of we hope. So um, Josh asked the question, sorry, Joshua, um, the, what is the rationale for keeping the Homans and mobile site separate? What is the value of the alley? Um, the alley is between the two buildings is it obviously provides service access. So depending on what the uses of the buildings are, if we're the, the image that's on the screen right now presumes that that might be a commercial lab building, which obviously has a whole lot more truck traffic um, and loading dock needs than say if it was a residential building. So it's not that the, um, it's, it's basically getting the loading off uh, Medford Street. Knowing that we have difficulties with the, the MBTA access, ro access road in the back. And so getting a rear alley makes these properties a whole lot shallower and therefore more difficult to develop. So having that shared alley uh, gives a, a, a potential um, shared resource point. Now, as far as keeping the, the two sites separate, um, we had looked at some of the, the previous schemes that did look at uh, combining the, the two sites into um, a larger holding, and that is, that is still potentially possible. What doesn't necessarily keep the character of the the neighborhood at a at a reasonable reasonable scale? Um, so it's there are pros and pros and cons to 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 both. Um, if a developer sort of sees that as being potential, um, one of the things that going out on a limb here that I will say is I, I don't want to see a large footprint lab building here. If it's a if it's a commercial building that that might have you know sort of uh, a more reasonable scale, then um, I think we should, you know, sort of potentially talk about that um, further. But um, with all the development pressure we're getting right now for lab, lab buildings in other portions of the city, the last place I want to bring it into is, you know, sort of between a an established neighborhood and and the you know high school. Um, but if, you know, that's something, if, if the neighborhood tells me that I'm wrong on that one, I will, I will definitely be more than willing to, 
uh, debate it further. So, um, all right. The, all right, Vicki. Vicki remains in favor of the small footprint design with a passage open to the sky, option A, because of its more human scale. Um, all right, that's great, thank you. Um, Stanny asks, to what level of detail will the city develop a selected scheme? Of great importance is the quality of the public space. For example, what is the relationship between the civic space and the train tracks? How does the civic space consider topography? If there is a connection to Richdale, what are the mechanisms to make sure the developers create a thoughtful design? Um, that is, there's a lot of, lot of great questions in there, Stani. Um, the, because a civic space has to go through its own separate design process with the city, there are a lot of, I'm going to call them checks and balances in, in place to make sure that we get the, um, the right influx you know, input there to the design. So the neighborhood will be very, very much involved in the detailed design of the civic space, just the way the, um, the new zoning process lays itself out for even for the building design. There will be neighborhood meetings, the, um, the Urban Design Commission review, um, that's for the buildings for the civic space. So there will be lots of opportunity for um, input. The difficulty that happens with the grade change is of course the ADA access. And because this will be a public civic space, making sure that it is accessible um, to all at, at all times is one of the main considerations. So the, in certain instances, the, there may be walls at the tracks required. There may be proposals where some of it is terraced, but then we have to consider ramping and steps as an integral part of the, the design process, of the, the actual design. So it's, um, that's a, that is a definite more detailed level than, than we had anticipated getting to at least as part of this process. So um, what this process intends to do is sort of get it to a point that we've got these potential schemes um, and a preferred scheme, hopefully. And it might be that we, you know, we end up with two, that when we go out for an RFP, you know, sort of it shows two schemes. It's not necessarily that, you know, sort of there's, there's just one, but at least we'll have some direction to be able to, to guide the, the, next, the next steps on the process. So hopefully, hopefully that helps. Um, Will asks, it seems like the C2 option would be mostly commercial given the footprint. Is there sufficient demand for this kind of office space in this location? <laughs> Will that actually begs a much, much larger question that um, even my magic eight ball doesn't know the answer to right now. Um, the, we have a lot of debates internally uh, within planning and zoning as to what does office space look like moving forward? Um, you know, sort of there's lots of anecdotal, uh, I really don't like the term anecdotal evidence because if it's anecdotal, it's not really evidence, but I was about to use that phrase. Um, there is, you know, sort of the, there's so many stories and articles out there at the moment about offices downsizing and hoteling desks um, and things like that. So what that looks like from a land use standpoint moving forward, um, we don't actually know. Um, one of the things that, at the same token, the idea that there's more potential for shared workspaces um, needed and whether that be 
artist, artist studios or makerspace or actually, you know, sort of like the WeWork facilities that are truly shared offices. Um, you know, sort of we we don't we don't know how great that demand is and how much of that might be filled by office space that already exists but is being reconfigured um, because of the changes that the, the pandemic has brought on to remote working. Um, so it's a, that one is a tough one uh, to, to be definitive about, but you know, that's there again, that's something that we wanna be flexible on so that if a developer does say to us, hey, you know, you could do um, a small office building here with small, you know, it doesn't have to be large footprints. It might be subdivided, or as I said, it might be, you know, sort of incubator space or something that's a whole lot smaller. So we're not sure yet, but I don't think it'll be regular class A office space. And <laughs> Rachel, I'm sorry, I'm probably speaking way out of turn. If you want to throw, if you want to comment on this as well, it's sort of I should have let you take this one, probably. No, Sarah, that's um, uh, that's all um, about where we are. There's a lot of still unknowns in the process. We're we're still putting together what the what that procedure is going to look like uh, in terms of the next steps with the RFP and. Um, there's a, you know, a variety of ways it could go and there's a lot to consider and um, we'll be keeping in touch with, with the neighborhood as that sort of timeline develops too. Thank you. Um, all right, Matt says, it seems like between the building three on the Triangle Park and a tiny civic space provided, there's not a whole lot of the square coming back. It actually seems like we're getting a net loss of public space. Do any options work with keeping the Triangle Park or a large public square? Um, I believe the, the idea that the, whether there is a, um, you know, sort of an active civic space building structure in the, the scheme that we're looking at currently, um, I think that is a that is a larger larger space, and that's similar to the um, scheme B um, that we had looked at as well. So um, the that yes, thank you. Um, so that that scheme is probably a, a net gain as well. Um, so I think the. Um, Keeping the Triangle Park might be a different approach. I will say what we had talked to about to the consultant team is knowing that the Triangle Park has serious grade change challenges and what couldn't necessarily be um, a fully usable civic space um, that because of its accessibility challenges. Um, we can certainly we can certainly go back uh, and and look at that, um, but the idea of sort of where we were where we had guided the the team was was to look at uh, other other spaces, um, but still keeping the the very visual visual prominence. Um, the um, Teresa would like to guarantee all HVAC will be electric heat pumps, green, no oil or gas, especially if monstrously large. Um, yes, under the new ordinance, um, it's either um, it, we need to be all electric or um, at least uh, net zero ready. Um, and the Office of sustainability and environment are, are part of our re review team on, on every building project coming before the city. So we, we can pretty much guarantee that that will be definitely examined and they have to, if it's, if there are extenuating circumstances, we need to, we will understand what that is and, and push back as hard as we can because it is part of 
part of the summer vision to get us to a um, the, the net zero as close as we can. Um, uh, Stephen says, for example, you could trim the front corner off the high rise and add it back along the tracks. It will preserve the visual connection and protect the civic space from the noise of the tracks. That's a very good point. Um, that is something that we will we will talk to the team about and, and thank you, thank you for that input. Um, is there any way to add density while staying with the small footprint in option A? Uh, the answer is yes, it goes taller. Um, and so there are a couple of things that, while the term high rise is, obviously thinks of larger buildings um, generally, what the high rise district does is, you, is it, it allows for six story buildings, but without the step backs required. Um, so what that does is, and that's what ends up being the sort of the, which scheme was that scheme C, the purple building, if you remember that one in the middle that I think was um, about eight stories tall the way it was shown. Um, that is, is technically a high rise building, but not necessarily a podium tower or to its fullest height. Um, so anywhere between six and 10 stories can be a high rise building and it just doesn't require the setbacks. So we do have some flexibility there. Um, and I know Sophia, that was a long way to answer your, your question, but um, there are some, you know, sort of there, there is some flexibility with if we're willing to give up the step backs and, and get um, and go a little bit taller. Um, would like more open areas with trees and ban trucks and diesel and make sure protected bike lanes. If agreed to taller, need guarantees of that. Um, most definitely. So the, the work that has already been done on, on the Medford Street um, realignment, I believe has dedicated bike facilities um, shown, anticipated. So that I think is moving, moving forward already. Um, but that is something that we will, will definitely coordinate. Um, one of the things that we will need to be aware of, and this comes back to sort of some of the conversations we'd had about the, the, the civic space um, in the location next to the TPSS, is how the driveway access, what does that look like for the MBTA to access the equipment? How often do they go to that building? Um, so some of those questions will, will have to be resolved as well as the, you know, sort of the, the, the health issues that we had talked about and, and the potential noise implications. So the intersection, you know, sort of the intersection of the different mobilities, both you have the pedestrians and the park users in that location, and then the crossing of, of a driveway between trucks and, and bicycles or the pedestrians needs to be examined a whole lot more closely. Um, regarding the trees, it's one of the things that we have to um, be careful about due to the underground tank. So trees can still occur um, even with the underground tank. What it means is it needs to be buried deeper so that we get enough soil on top of the tank to allow for trees to actually grow and have, have the root space. So that's one of, those, um, one of those details that, as I'd mentioned about the design of the civic space um, that we will uh, get into in more detail later. Um, Courtney, did I say anything out of turn there? Because there again, I'm answering all sorts of things instead of throwing it to the experts who know more than I do. 
Uh, Sarah, you're doing a great job. Um, <laughs> yes, I, I can say that uh, construction technology has gone a long way for building um, all sorts of things over structure. Um, so I am confident that we can build a fantastic civic space over uh, a storage water tank. All right, thank you. Um, the, is the building shown in purple similar to the one nearing completion on South Street in Boynton Yards? Um, I don't think the, actually, um, Eleanor Rodrigo, can you tell us what the size of the footprint is on that one? I think it's actually smaller than the 101 South Street building. Yeah, that one in plan. So is that 11,500? Yes. Um, so that, that's, that's a lot smaller footprint than the one in Boynton Yards. Um, the one in Boynton Yards is um, approximately, I believe that's 110 by just over 200 feet. So that's a, you know, sort of that's a 20 something thousand footprint. Um, so the idea would be, uh, my rough guess, it's visually, I think it's half the size of that one. Um, Another comment question. Do not apologize, Christine. Not for comments and questions. That's what we're doing here. Um, based on the topography change along School Street, it's quite steep, approximately 14 feet, which could allow for two stories of active retail space activating the street front along School Street as well. Is this something we consider? Multiple, as in two floors of retail, especially for small and local businesses. Um, I think that is, yes, um, given that there is, um, you know, sort of work in the city at the moment to understand what small retail, small commercial spaces look like to protect local businesses um, and to assist them. That is definitely something we can look at. I think the, the key there is the elevation along School Street and probably would need some really detailed section cuts as to understand um, how it steps down the, the hill. But yes, I believe that would um, I, I believe that would be possible. And without necessarily having a requiring a, a second floor commercial space or a two, you know, sort of a, a two-story commercial space. I think there, there, there are potential, there's definitely architectural solutions there that can be looked at. Um, Councillor Klingen asks, in terms of next steps, how can we figure out the financials of a development in which we would like to get as much affordable housing at the home and site before we put out any RFP? Or how do we figure that number out ahead of time? Um, that would probably be we would we would need um, either a uh, either to ask a, a developer to look at the pro forma, or there are probably consultants that we we have that could run those numbers for us. I don't know that any of the economic teams are necessarily experts in affordable housing because with affordable housing, the uh, financing is, as I understand it, is the trickiest, um, the trickiest thing to work out. Um, but we can certainly in, investigate what that looks like. And um, I, I will talk with, um, we will talk internally uh, to, to understand sort of who might be the right consultant to do that and, and whether that is something we can figure that out ahead of time as to what those numbers look like. Um, the next question is, can the schematics be updated to include how the new high school will look, including Revis Field above the station? Um, yes, they can. So uh, we will, um, as we as we're sort of getting in um, 
to to some of these as we start processing some of these comments and what it looks like for the next phases. So as as we get to sort of some final graphics that we'll we'll use to sort of guide future conversations, um, we can we can definitely make sure that the 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 high school edge is is included, the the steps in the field and and where the elevator is in relation to the station, I think. I think it's definitely a useful um, inclusion. Um, Vicki thinks a tunnel needs to be tall, three stories, to feel expansive rather than claustrophobic. Um, I I would I would agree, and given the other comments that we've we've heard, so it, it sort of depends on the the proportions of that building architecturally is in order to, to pull that off, it probably needs to be at least a, a six story building as a minimum to have a, a three story open space with, and have it not look quite um, squatty. I'm losing my architectural terms right now, but um, we do need to consider proportions, but I th thank you for that comment. Um, Another comment is, I think the housing shortfall in Somerville and Greater Boston is an incentive to build the taller high rise option, C3, only as housing. Anything else? Probably not. That's a very good point. Thank you so much. Um, how do we quantify how much open space there is once an option is selected for the RFP? Is it a percentage of the site? is a location specified that a developer will have to stick to. Um, there will potentially be all of that. Um, as, as we write an RFP, um, Rachel, we can pretty much craft that RFP as, as we see fit, I believe. Yeah, so all of these considerations could fit into the RFP and it doesn't necessarily have to be in some instances, it's going to be quite clear what we're looking for. In other instances, it's going to be we're looking for feedback or we're looking for an idea, a response, right? So it could be something that says um, we're looking for a number of open space or a percentage and that or factor, we could write it in as an or statement, right? So there's an option to sort of say, these are our priorities and these are how we'd like to see that met. If you can meet it another way, let's talk. So there's a, there's a lot of flexibility in how we structure this. Although I would suggest that the um, size of the tank may have a direct impact on the size of the open space, given that we, it's been recommended that we locate the tank under open space rather than under buildings. And actually that gets to the next question from, from Tim. Um, one of my concerns is this retention tank limiting the addition of new trees. I'd like to hear how landscaping would be affected if placed in the open space. And so, Tim, that was that was something sort of got to a little bit before. But Courtney, is there more detail that you can provide on on the tree types and things like that that might be able to be put over the the tank? Um, I, I think that there are a lot of trees that can be in consideration to be used over structure. It's always just, um, we have to look at the, the, the soil volumes, um, but it's, it's pretty well established that uh, a significant number of trees, their active root zone is typically within 24 to 36 inches of soil depth. Um, so if we're looking at construction over structure, um, you know, we would definitely be planning for soil depths um, at, at that level um, to, to have trees. Um, obviously, smaller vegetation like shrubs, uh, perennials, uh, grasses, those uh, do not need to take up as much um, depth, but there are a lot of um, examples of constructed uh, parks over, over structure. I can um, name for example, in the Boston area, Post Office Square, 
um, is a pretty commonly referenced project that is over a parking garage. Um, but there are some very significantly sized trees um, in that park, you know, very, very tall canopies. Um, the whole uh, Greenway Park system in Boston is over I-93. Um, and, you know, there's a huge variety of landscaping types um, throughout that whole corridor. And um, even when you get to the, the North End parks, that has the shallowest um, uh, depth where I think there's about six inches between um, some of the above grade construction and then the top of the, the tunnel below. Um, so I, I don't think anyone, um, you know, necessarily thinks too much about the all the, the the structure and engineering that goes on under the ground and all those spaces but they feel you know the ideas that these feel like you know full-blown parks that would be constructed on regular ground we have a question um, about um, Remy how high is 128 feet with respect to Lean in, Charlotte. Your mic is doing it again. Dang it. Thank you. Um, <laughs> can we go to the uh, C2, but the massing option to answer this question? I think that'll be uh, one more, the section cut. There we go. Thank you. Um, so Ramu, this is this is what it would look like um, compared to where the high school is and where City Hall is. And now I hand it back over to Sarah. Um, we have a comment from a, a question from an anonymous attendee who asks, how can we stop this to preserve our neighborhood? Um, so um, where I will say the site will, pro will likely be developed. Why we are going through this exercise is to try to make sure it is in keeping and appropriate to, to the neighborhood. Um, so um, your, your concerns are, are, are very much noted. Um, uh, so, but, and thank you. Thank you for, uh, thank you for coming out. Um, we do appreciate it. And we know this is, there's a lot of change going on in the city right now, which is often very, very hard to, um, to stomach. Um, the, um, uh, my, from Sophia, my sense is that the alley in all the designs except A and B is an uninviting area that will not be very attractive to either residents or passers through neighbors. Both A and B retain some of the connection between Pearl and Richdale, but also makes for a much more attractive open space. Thank you. That's a, that is a good comment. Yeah. And the, the, the alley, as I had mentioned before, is intended in the, um, in scheme C was intended to be just that and an alley. So it would be a, a service drive rather than um, more than not, necess not necessarily an open space. It would be a, a service access. Um, but this is, it's, a, it's good. It does make sure while the, the connection to Richdale is being shown, I, I think you're, you're right, that might not um, make much sense in, in this particular scheme connecting to the alley. Thank you for that. Um, Linda says, one of the proposals follows along the property lines as they already exist. What are the implications, if any, of this in terms of how easy, how, or how difficult it will be to develop the space? Would it be easier to attract developers or make no difference at all? Um, Unfortunately, that's a too soon to tell um, kind of uh, uh, question. The, we have looked at it um, both ways, but the idea of a, whether it's one large footprint or whether the footprints are shown differently, um, I, I think that does, we do want to give that option to the 
to a development team. But what we've gone through so far in the schemes that have been shown, it's it sounds like the at least from what we've heard is is the neighborhood is sort of leaning towards the um, you know sort of the the, the two footprints on the the mobile and hope and site, not necessarily along existing property lines, but keeping the the scale of the buildings a little bit um, a little bit smaller. Um, uh, uh, another anonymous attendee, I purchased my condo 20 years ago in this area because there were no high rise building. What about the locals who bought in decades ago would like? Um, that is hopefully what we're, we're trying to, we're trying to listen to everybody at this point in time. And, and so the, if there are feelings about how high the, you know, sort of the, the site should be developed, um, we would like to know sort of what that, that comfort level is um, from, you know, sort of different people. We've heard from that some people are more, you know, sort of would like to see six stories. If there are people who imagine that it's not going to be taller than four, we need to hear that too. So please, you know, sort of continue to express your, your concerns. Um, the... And I'm apologizing, I assume this is the same anonymous attendee. I don't think any of us are being heard. We are noted and dismissed. I would very, very much like you to express an opinion. Um, and so whether that's, you know, sort of, if you can, you know, sort of write us a note uh, about um, what you would like to see, I, I think that would be, that would be very, very helpful. Um, uh, if you terrace the public space, adding soil and fill over the tank in the civic space, then we can plant whatever we want. <laughs> Christine, that is true. Thank you. It does open new challenges um, to, as I said, for an ADA uh, access, but um, thank you. We will, <laughs> we will, as we get into the open space, we will consider more. Um, and, and Matt asks, why can't a lot of this be figured out with an overlay district? Um, it could be done as an overlay district. It could be done as a, you know, sort of a, 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 a map amendment. Um, and until we know where we want to go, I, I sort of, I'm, I'm trying to be absolutely open-minded as the right place, the, the right direction to um, uh, the, the, the right way to, to, to get into uh, regulations um, on, on this area. Um, the, we have another comment from the anonymous attendee. This is stunning in the sense that you have been provided community input for many meetings. It is embarrassing to hear this, the city say now that it wants to hear of us, hear from us. The message we're receiving is that community input does not matter, prove us wrong. Um, the beginning of this presentation, we went through what we had heard and gave an overview of what the process has been so far. Um, if, if we have not heard from enough of the community, then we still need to hear more, but I, it's our understanding that the community has been involved in this process pretty actively all along. Um, so perhaps this is something that um, you and I should talk about independently just to make sure that we are getting all the opinions and, and maybe this is not the, the venue to engage some members because I'm, I'm well aware that the digital link platform for engagement is, is more stilted than it ever has been before. Um, so I, I will, um, Charlotte, if you could make sure my email address is is in the chat um, or reply to this question with a typed answer, I'd appreciate it. Will do. Um, how much of the civic space will be green space? The more the better, completely agree. Um, what 
and and Courtney will you know sort of the um, how much the uh, how much of the trees we can get in this area to sort of get us canopy to get us real green space um, and that's why sort of the the, the tank was such a um, a wrench sort of thrown into our our process as we, you know, it came in late to the game in the midst of, of what we had already started talking about. So how that gets detailed and the trees and the green, um, we, and it's, it's not just, uh, it's not just public space and urban forestry that is interested in, in green space planning and zoning, you know, sort of these, these civic spaces are the lungs of our city. And so the more the better is right. I, I can also just add to that, that um, when we have new, uh, new parks, new green spaces, new civic spaces, um, sites become available, uh, we, we strongly encourage our design team or if this, is, uh, this process becomes uh, through a developer, um, we, we have them go through a civic space study process that looks at all of our parks and open spaces within a half mile and a mile radius of the site to sort of look and make sure that um, we're, we're not missing something or we have too much of something um, as a way to, to gut check um, any new project. Um, but the, the city overall, we've been working very hard to try to increase canopy, tree canopy cover everywhere we possibly can. And this is definitely an area that is lacking um, trees. So, you know, we would love to include green and encourage green in the space as much as possible. Um. Uh, so Alicia asked the question, can building one be built so it's similar in height to one Richdale at, at School Street? Um, I believe that is a, is a three-story um, three building. Um, the, uh, and so that is, that is something that, that can, be, can be looked at. Um, as far as the What's interesting is because of the grade change, um, it might be able to, um, to actually be, this gets to one of the other comments earlier, gets to the, to the point that it might be able to have, you know, sort of retail staggered on, on different floors. So it might be on the second floor at the, the tracks end of the building and then step down to the corner. Um, so, how that um, happens in uh, architectural solutions um, is, you know, sort of will definitely be looked at, but understanding what the relationship is of the, the buildings across School Street will definitely be. Sarah, I, I might comment that the yeah. that, that that one Richdale building is about the site is about 4,500 square feet, which is quite similar to our option A. The two parcels are about 4,700 square feet each. So it's uh, it's actually in that version, it's quite close uh, to it, although we are showing them at uh, four stories going up to six, uh, so it is a little bit, they're a little bit taller, but in terms of their footprint, they're quite similar. Um, okay, uh, comment, the community has been involved with this all along. The GSNA has been involved with, with this. We spent months working on recommendations. We, JSNA, are not seeing our recommendations incorporated. Instead, we are seeing the sudden addition of high rise as part of the conversation. We questioned the height of six stories in the rear of the building. We're in favor of development, but this is far, far from what we proposed. Um, the scheme C, I completely agree with you. Um, However, scheme A is, is the, the scheme that is built from the original work that the GSNA team had done. 
um, what we, the only changes have been to make sure that these are building types that can be conforming under the, the zoning ordinance. Um, and so that's where these investigations came from. Um, the, if, if six stories is, is too high, then we, we can definitely, you know, sort of talk about lowering them. But in previous comments, we, we had heard that, that, that six was, was a, as a, a good place to start, but we can certainly, um, we can certainly revisit the height of the, the, the neighborhood scheme as the, the work had been done. So, um, uh, talking through that in, in more detail is, is, uh, sounds like it's definitely, definitely in need. So we will do that. Um, Will says the mobile station is currently owned by a private owner. Yes. If we upzone that parcel as part of this process, will the vastly increased value of the site simply be captured by the current owner? How do we ensure that some of that value goes toward public benefits such as affordable housing, open space, et cetera? Um, um, that's a, there are many ways, and I'll, I'll let Rachel mostly answer this one, I think, but, but there, are, there are many ways that, that that could happen. And so the idea of, of partnering um, with the current owner, the idea of, you know, sort of not rezoning until um, we determine, get more information on what does, you know, sort of to, to some of the earlier conversations about affordable housing, you know, sort of what the fee, what the feasibility is for this site is, is why, you know, sort of not rezoning it too soon is sort of part of the conversation. Um, but I think there's, you know, so there's there's any number of ways that 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 could potentially come to to fruition. Um, whether the the private owner does it themselves um, separately than the the city parcel, or or whether there is a a teaming there, um, I think there's there's potential. Um, Joanne says, I never thought that Gilman would be nation for lab space. I prefer. The plans that keep the buildings at MR6 have the civic space that is not just one tiny pocket of the old home in sight at the Pearl Street elbow has the connection to Richdale. If mid block passage, mid block passage will be covered, I think it needs to be at least three stories high to feel open and inviting. Thanks for all the work put into this future development. And Joanne, thank you for a, a concise and comprehensive um, uh, opinion that that's that's very helpful to us and Vicki agrees that option a reflects the old option six so hopefully that's the I don't remember Alan was the old option six the uh, the small print the GSNA scheme I believe it was um, oh, the only changes we made were uh, moving the the sort of red building and making it more independent, not attached to one of the other buildings. Otherwise, it's very similar. All right. Well, I think that's that's all of that's all of the questions that I see right now. Um, and. Um, I do want to um, acknowledge that there's a, there's a note in the chat that as soon as possible after the meeting, we'll have a recording of this and a copy of the presentation on, on the Summer Voice site. Um, so, uh, um, one more, let's see where we are. Um, I know Matt asks, I know this question is for the streetscape, but these plans show a rather large crossing with parking. Is there any way to adjust this so that the distance in the right of way is not so large? Um, that unfortunately the mobility team couldn't 
couldn't be with us this evening, but that is definitely a question for them. So um, Matt, we'll make sure that uh, that that gets posed to them. I I have a feeling it might just be a, um, a a graphic convention that we're looking at, but we will double check and make sure that that is um, we're coordinated where we need to be. Um, and we have a thing on to that. I Sorry. Um, go ahead. To add on to that question from Matt, I believe it's shown as a parking area, but it's really meant more as like a flexible loading zone, not a pure parking area um, in the kind of traditional street parking manner. Um, but beyond that, that would be a question for mobility, but to the best that I can remember from previous plans, that's what it is. Yeah. And in the plan that we're, that's a good point, Charlotte, in the plan that we're looking at now, loading would, would have to be done on street. Um, just because there is, there is no alley um, to, to provide that, that access. So that does get a bit, a bit challenging. Um, the, uh, we have, we have multiple so I appreciate it. Thank you for the clarification regarding option A is vis-a-vis -vis the GSNA scheme. Um, and and a thank you from Sophia. So thank you all so much um, for participating. And, and we'll this this conversation is is not over. You can you can continue um, the you know e email us at, at planning at um, the address, the, the Somerville MA.gov. Um, email. I do recommend that you put um, Gilman Square in the subject line, as Rebecca says in the chat, that that will be helpful so we know how to direct um, comments and questions. Um, and then, you know, sort of keep keep your eyes on the, the Summer Voice page um, for for more information as as we go go through this. So, um, Thank you all so much for coming. Um, uh, appreciate it. And oh, we've got a few more comments and thank you. So thank you for your thank yous too. <laughs> and um, I mentioned in the chat that we will have the presentation and recording posted on Summer Voice. We should have that hopefully within the next few days, but I will plan to um, email everyone who attended this meeting, just an FYI once that is up, um, so that if you have additional comments, you can reference reference the presentation and all of that while you while you make those comments. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Um, the um, oh, wait, one more last question. Well, you don't want me to have dinner tonight, do you? Um, I'm kidding. Um, would it make sense to have the civic space retention tank at the mobile site? Would it would make it more accessible from <laughs> Rich Richdale? Will's apologizing to me now because I'm yanking this chain. All right, let me start over. Um, would it make more sense to have the civic space retention tank at the mobile site? Would it make it more accessible from Richdale? Would it make it easier to coordinate with the timing? of the sale of the private parcel. Just one more thought, because I agree with the above comment that the narrow alley wouldn't really be that attractive. That's a very good phasing question, given the, the fact that anything that happens on the mobile site is gonna have to dig their tanks out currently anyway. Um, so um, I will flag that one for engineering because that's, a, that's an interesting construction phasing question. So thank you, thank you, Will. Um, and on, on that note, um, before he thinks up anything else, um, no, I'm, I'm kidding. I am going to say good night. Um, the, I would, um, there was a comment earlier from Ben, um, not Council UN Camp, and it just said Ben in the chat. Um, if you would like to, email me directly, then um, I will gladly walk through this, this with you be, um, to make sure that, that you, you didn't miss anything at the, the beginning. So um, as, as, I, as, as hopefully has been in the chat and hopefully everybody knows how to get a hold of me, but I am S. Lewis, L-E-W-I-S, at somervillema.gov. 
So, so Ben, please, please email me and, and I'll, I'll set up a time where, where we can talk directly. Um, so thank you all so much. Um, I appreciate your time and, and input and effort. So thank you. Have a good night.